The Solar Podcast is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today on the Solar Podcast, tools for measuring solar system performance. My guest today is Paolo Suarez. He is a researcher, recent PhD graduate from Penn State University. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for this opportunity. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, th and a shout out to Mark Kleingina for introducing us. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, you know, there's this, uh, there's this delta that we're aware of in the industry. You design a system to uh, produce a certain amount of energy, and then you build a system, and, and then you prop it up and you start collecting uh, information and of course the system is producing kwh but there's always a there's always a delta between what the system is producing and what the system was designed to produce or could produce in a perfect world and the chat one of the challenges is that of course well there's there's a myriad of challenges here but one of the major challenges is that the weather fluctuates tremendously from minute to minute day to day hour to hour week to week, month to month, et cetera, et cetera. No two, uh, no two hours are the same and no two months are the same year after year, right? And so we are dependent on these long-term data sets, which are very useful, uh, you know, that allow us to model a, the productivity of an array in a specific geography. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, what a, what a long-term asset owner wants to know is how many KWH on an annual basis am I going to get out of this project? Because that drives my, uh, my ROI and my pro forma, et cetera, et cetera. So before we get into all of this, Paolo, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to the United States. Awesome. So I'm an environmental engineer. I'm from Brazil. Uh, so I got both my bachelor's and my master's in Brazil. Uh, so that was, I basically finished my master's and came to the US. My wife actually got this awesome opportunity to uh, pursue her master's here at Penn State University, State College PA. So we came, we came together and I'm in the United States since then, since 2015. I started my PhD in 2017 and finished just this May, and it's all about solar. And tell us a little more about what you did for your PhD research. Sure. So my PhD is focused on two things mainly. So first portion, or part A, is about the solar radiance and solar radiance measurement. So I divide uh, this PhD in two portions because one is really about this uh, more hyperlocal ground-based uh, data acquisition systems that we'll discuss today. Now I call them the solar irradiance detector and the all CNI, uh, solar radiometric system. And the other portion is more related to uh, our more less refined data. So uh, and GIS methods to estimate the feasibility of um, places for PV deployment and also for agrivoltaic um, sort of uh, business. And why is there an opportunity, so to speak, or a problem to be solved? What is the status of the industry? What are the, what is the best practices that are being applied in the field? And how is your work relevant to that? Great question. So since the, even before starting a PhD, actually, I had this uh, goal of researching or working at something that is tied to the needs of the industry, right? So in terms of part A, the solar radiance measurement, um, I will say we, because this is, I was part of a research group, right? So we identified that people in the industry, I won't say in general, but some at least, they, there's this, what we call like an over-reliance on TMY, typical meteorological year data. 
And as you mentioned, that large data sets that is uh, then let's say average or uh, to put it roughly into a single year, you have of course differences, these deltas as you mentioned, and this is expected, but sometimes, I mean, it's expected for me because I'm researching about it, I understand uh, that this difference can be expected, but sometimes it's not that straightforward for other people. So this connection with uh, industry is something that really made my dissertation, at least to, to my point of view, more applied. So not just a theoretical work, but something that really people can use as a path for doing or developing systems to use like the, the air will take portion, for example, is a model that can be applied to understand the local social, environmental and technical details or characteristics, pardon me, of the place that the uh, lead modeler or the team wants to explore. So it's really, really practical, although it's uh, to the best of my knowledge, state of the art research. So let's, let's dive into this a little deeper. I mean, one of the statistics that we uh, solar designers pay a lot of attention to is insulation, which is KWH per KWP. Mm -hmm. And that figure varies with your technology, the, the tilt angle of the array. Are you using fixed tilt or are you using trackers? Uh, so, you know, here in Illinois, we're getting uh, in far northern Illinois, 1200 KWH per KWP for fixed tilt rooftop solar. And then if you put that same solar array on a single axis tracker, you might get 1500 KWH per KWP. Um, because then the array is tracking the sun and you're getting more direct radiation onto your solar array, right? And then you're putting a, uh, you know, with certainly uh, community solar with small utility or utility scale, you're putting a uh, weather station at the array so that you know what is, you know, how much radiation is the site receiving objectively and then you're clocking the KWH with a uh, utility grade meter and you're collecting RECs, right? One REC is one megawatt hour of electricity. But going into that, you have a model and uh, you know these models are very important because the, the, that leads to a contract and that contract has teeth. And if you fall short of your production, uh, the state of Illinois is gonna fine you because they're trying to green the grid. So this is very important stuff, but what is wrong with that approach? What, what, are the, what are the weak links in the standard approach that we're using today? Well, I think the, uh, the standard approach uh, again, to the best of my knowledge, relies a lot on the, uh, the meter, let's say, as you mentioned. So you understand your system, you understand the components, you understand your inverter, and you understand the power that is being generated. And this is great. This is the information we all need. But if the uh, company, let's say, doesn't understand the resource which is really what is crucial here, right? So if you have, uh, if you think about the solar PV system, it's all about solar radiance. Without it, it doesn't work. So having this knowledge, this understanding of the uh, solar resource at this site that you are deploying or you have deployed your system gives you this reference, gives you this uh, certainty or not that your system is performing as it should. I mean, you know that it's no, you don't have a, any problem with your system by looking at the inverters, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you don't know if there's something shading the panels or something because you don't, you might not understand the um, the solar resource.
Okay, but um, you know, presumably the monitoring system, let's say also energy is one of the, the big dogs in that industry. Uh, that software is taking into account what the weather station is telling it about what the weather's been. And it's looking at what the array is producing. And then it's, it's giving you some kind of a report, good, bad, or ugly, right? That things are fine or things are perhaps out of whack and you need to take a look. And then there's a process for figuring out, well, what might be wrong, right? Maybe it's just that there's dust accumulated on the solar panels and they need to be cleaned. Uh, maybe some of those solar panels are broken and not performing. And so some strings are not producing as much, uh, you know, voltage as they should be. There's a myriad of problems, but so one of the things that we talked about in the pre-show is that, well, A, these weather stations and, and the, the monitoring systems are quite expensive. Um, are, you, are you suggesting that there's a better way to solve this problem? Certainly more than one way. Um, so as you mentioned, the weather stations are expensive. And this is one important, really, really important piece of this puzzle, especially like since one of the things that motivated me to really develop these different systems, let's say solar radiometric systems, is the, the cost. So I, for example, I worked for a weather service uh, in Brazil for, for about a year before coming to the US. So working with instrumentation and all that, and every time we need to like acquire new sensors, uh, procure new sensors, procure new data loggers and weather stations, we have to take into account not just the price of the, uh, of the equipment, but also because it's all imported, taxes and the conversion of the money. So it ended up like many times it was impeditive or it was something that would have really difficult for the for the company. So even if it was like a large or medium-sized company. So this is something that was one of the uh, of my motivations, right? So having this path, as I as I call it, so really because it's it is in in the uh, in the end of the day uh, a prototype is a my research uh, for my PhD. But it's a working prototype. It's something that people can replicate and then develop something more uh, refined depending on their needs on top of that. Not sure if I, did I answer the question? I'm not sure, but let's, um, I'm gonna put the device on screen so our, use, our listeners can see what we're talking about. Here's the ACE radiometric system being tested in the field. And ACE stands for what? The all CNI, because it has five sensors, five pyranometers. All seeing eye, okay, right, right, and and uh, so these little these little sensors up here are measuring how much radiation they're receiving. That's correct. Those are photodiode-based sensors, and yeah. you can see there is one pointing upwards that is measuring global horizontal radiance. And sure. the other four are tilted 90 degrees towards the cardinal directions, which uh, this configuration gives us the response based on the position of the relative position of the sun at any given time. Mm -hmm. So for example, the, in the morning, for example, the east sensor will be um, measuring higher levels of solar radiance compared to the global and to the west and then it changes. So it really gives this, uh, yeah. how can I say, it's, uh, it's not a path, but it's this common um, standard, right? That the, because uh, this is tied to a machine learning algorithm and then the machine learning algorithm can understand this patterns. 
and really decouple the information that we, we wanted to decouple, mm -hmm. which is the direct and diffuse irradiance. Yeah. And, but typically you would also want a sensor that is at the same angle as the solar panels, right? That is correct. And so the systems are flexible enough. Uh, if you, if you want to uh, put the uh, image back, please. Sure. So if you notice here, the bottom of the, uh, of the data logger case, which is this white rounded piece, which has the uh, Penn State logo, actually, the eye blinks, just one thing that is pretty cool. <laughs> just closing parentheses. The, uh, uh, at the bottom of, the, of this case, there is space for adding a new pyranometer or another pyranometer. And then you can uh, place this in the same mast towards the tilting it according to the, to the desired application. Could be plane of array radiance, could be albedo. It's up to the person that is using the system. Yeah. And, but so uh, tell me more about how this works. So you're, you're getting this information. You've got these algorithms that are deciphering the information. Um, and and at, the, at, the, at the end of the day though, you have to do this comparison, right? Between what the array is producing versus what the sensors say the array should be producing. Um, right, exactly. And, and how is that different though than what is being practiced in the field today? So for example, the, uh, the measurement of the DNI is a little more, or sorry, direct normal irradiance is a little more complicated, for example, due to the highly elevated cost of the systems, right? So that is one differential here. We can use that with tracking PV systems to understand how much the, uh, what is the intensity of the direct, the beam from the sun is, and then compare to the to the uh, power being generated by the array. In contrast, the, um, let's say if you have a fixed tilt system and you have a plane of array irradiance uh, detector, such as the, uh, the one uh, we mentioned uh, before, you can use that um, to first compare against your models. So if you, have run your PV assist or helioscope SAM models, you can compare that against a very hyper local source of data, right? So you can feed those models with different data and see how they compare to the uh, actual generation of your PV system. Besides, since it is relatively inexpensive, it can be used, and we hope that it it becomes true later. Uh, a network of such as sensors could be deployed, so we have more hyper local data available. It could be used to triangle with different uh, technologies, such as satellites, and really get more accurate uh, local level data. Mm -hmm. So is, this is a uh, more, better, cheaper scenario. The technology that you are developing is going to solve the same problem, but in a better, in a, in a, in a more technologically savvy and potentially cheaper fashion. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, especially uh, if we consider the LCNI uh, because of this flexibility of measuring different components of, of solar rings, which are normally very expensive to, to be measured, right? So for example, just to give uh, our audience a flavor, uh, typically to measure the direct normal radiance, you use a perheliometer, which is a system that tracks the relative position of the sun and the sky at every given moment. But 
as you can imagine, you have a tracking mechanism, you have a very uh, uh, accurate sensor that combine it, increase this cost or take this cost to uh, five digits sometimes. So it is something very expensive. Uh, we're talking about a $200 system here that I developed. So it is a significant different in cost. Mm -hmm. And what, what, when you, uh, when you think about, you know, your role in the solar industry, how does this, how does this play out? Are you uh, going to pursue commercialization of this technology or are you going to go in-house for an established manufacturer and uh, help them take their game to the next level? Both options are actually interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, when I mentioned that my goal with this portion of my research was to provide a path, is because we have this basic, let's say, you, you saw it's a prototype, right? This is available online, but it's not a problem if people want to take that and refine and make it a different version a different model or even incorporate different um, uh, characteristics or to the lack of a better word more can it be applied to more things yeah so that is that is possible and i'm i'm excited about both possibilities actually yeah you know i um as we were talking about in the pre-show, you had a conversation with, with Dan Leary at Dino Watts Solar, um, who is, you know, has a, uh, a device that does some similar things to what you're pursuing. Um, and in his opinion, he thought your technology would be very, in, you know, of interest to the single axis tracker manufacturers. Um, you know, one of the challenges with, with trackers is that every row in the array is not receiving the same amount of light. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the sky is not a uniform phenomenon, the sky has clouds in it. And, and so literally every row is, is experiencing a slightly different environment, unless, unless there's like a perfectly clear day, um, which, which is, you know, does happen, especially in, you know, the Southwest where there's, uh, a, di a different climate than we have here in the Midwest. But here in the Midwest, there's, there's almost always some clouds uh, going on and they're moving, right? So it's a very dynamic scenario. And so those algorithms that are figuring out not only what's going on, but how to optimize their position relative to the sun, because it's not just a matter of every row pointing the, at the same angle uh, to, to, to maximize production, actually, right, you have to make every row have a unique position. And, 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 uh, and so both mechanically and from a software engineering perspective, this is, this is a difficult problem. When you think about that problem and, you know, what the uh, next trackers and array technologies Etc. cetera, uh, of the world are doing, what do you, what do you get excited about and, and how, do you, how do you plug into that world? Right, that's a great question. Um, so let's talk about clouds and PV systems for a second. What, you, what you're pointing is absolutely true and absolutely important. Um, yes, the clouds, it's a very dynamic system. We have different types of clouds and different types of cloud means different interactions, mean different performance of the PV system. You might have a type of cloud that is thin enough that won't affect as much your, the response of your PV system. And on the other hand, if you have those puffy clouds, then you, you know that that will be, uh, cause an impact to your system. And also depends on the size of this um, tracking, let's say solar farm. 
if it is small scale or medium scale, maybe then you don't have that much of a problem. Again, depending on where you are, as you correctly pointed. Um, State College, for example, we have the same problem. It is the clouds are, we have all types of clouds. They're constantly moving. So it is a challenge for the, for the machine learning algorithm to take care of all of that for sure. Um, and in this case of having a large system with um, these different uh, configurations, let's say, that is, uh, that is something really exciting because how do we best solve this problem? Do we uh, add more sensors to the, to the site? Or where do we position the sensor so we can have the information we need? And of course, if you think about a large uh, solar array, it, is, it can be vast enough that a portion of it is totally shaded and a portion of it's not shaded, right? Yep. And so these type of problems are, are very interesting to me. I don't have like a full answer how I would solve this problem right now, but I hope to have someday. So if, if I'm a manufacturer and I'm trying to keep up with the big boys, right? That's, that's one of the challenges uh, in the tracker industry is that it is becoming more and more a software and artificial intelligence industry more than a hardware industry, even though at the end of the day, they make hardware. It's how intelligent that hardware is that is going to make or break them and their competitiveness in the industry. And um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, about that artificial intelligence component, for example, where, how, how well do you understand that and how much is machine learning a part of your, uh, your, you know, your system or your capabilities? Right. So, well, in terms of all CNI, that's the only one with the multi right? That's the only one, uh, the, the only system that has the machine learning algorithm running. What I can say to, to respond to your question, I think very honestly, is I know of machine learning well enough to solve the problem that I needed to solve. However, if there is a better way of solving it, it is quite possible, right? So it is something that I would like to keep researching on to really say, what is the best combination? It's not just also like, probably not just machine learning for solar irradiance that could solve this problem. We could have image recognition tied to that so we can understand what types of clouds are above the sensor. Mm -hmm. So this is this, and unfortunately like a PhD is something that has a limited amount of time. So I could not explore everything that I really wanted, but at least I could touch on the main things that I, I like it to, to learn and also to develop. So, and that includes machine learning. I tested different algorithms, at least five or six, uh, and variations of those algorithms to find the one that was the most suitable to solve this problem. And this problem, I mean, the problem, how it is framed right now, we could frame the problem in a different way as I mentioned, to include that camera and it might change the game a little bit. But uh, this, the short answer to your question is I, I could manage to learn and to apply machine learning algorithms well enough to, to solve the problem <laughs> within a limit, uh, confidence range, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is an interesting time because 
sensors are becoming very, very affordable. And right. so you, you do have the ability uh, either now or in the near future to put many, many more sensors in your facility, whether you're a manufacturing plant or a solar array and, um, and you know, then collecting much, much more information. And then it's a question of what you do with that information at the end of the day. We're trying to, uh, you know, avoid downtime. We're trying to avoid false alarms and false truck rolls, right? Where you're actually sending technicians out into the field to solve a problem that may or may not exist. And, um, and those things, you know, really do make a huge difference to the ROI of a solar project in the long run. What else, what else should uh, manufacturers or other stakeholders, uh, you know, EPCs, solar developers, solar financiers, solar asset owners, what else should we be thinking about when it comes to uh, solar performance? Right. Besides, uh the solar, the solar irradiance, right, which is the beginning of the process. So the process really starts with the sun. We have like the photons reaching the, the, the panels and then we have PV generation. And then we have to measure that too. So measuring this before and after of generation, right? It's quite important for sure. Um, what else? I would say the models that we use, really. Um, for example, if we try to understand the solar resource based on a more simple model, which is models depends on data, right? So in, what I'm trying to say, if we don't use the right data set, we might see very different results in reality. So having this care, I would say, and I, and I see the industry doing that, guys, or at least moving this direction of not just relying one set of data, but benchmarking it against others and all of that. So that's, that's the two things that come to my mind right now. I think that everything that is a source of uncertainty should be, should be seen with care and with proper care. Is there anything else that you and I should talk about this afternoon? Um, and we're almost at the end of our hour, but uh, happy to cover anything else you want to talk about. And then we'll let our listeners know how they can reach you. Excellent. Um, so if people want to check out the, uh, the solar radiance detector, the SID or the LCNI, um, solarecology.psu.edu, uh, we can... You can actually try to replicate the, the sensors if you want. If you have a 3D printer, for example, that is something that could be fun. Um, and yeah, there's also my contact information at the same website, but I'm happy to, to share my email here too, if needed, or cell phone. That website is on screen now, solarecology.psu.edu. And so when you go to contact us, then you see Paolo's email there, P Suarez, S O A R E S, at PSU.edu. And right. with that, I will also make a couple of announcements. You can find all of the solar podcast content at CESNRG.com forward slash podcast. We are bringing you these interviews at least once a week. And then also, a news roundup called the Clean Power Hour with my co-host John Weaver, where we bring you all the news related to the clean energy transition. Please give the podcast a thumbs up on YouTube. The new the uh, the news roundup, the Clean Power Hour is also available on audio only. But my podcast, this this podcast, the Solar Podcast, is only on YouTube. Please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and by all means. Uh, make comments. We love to hear from our listeners. That's the only way I know what it is that you want to hear about. And if you have ideas for future guests, please reach out to me. You can reach me 
on the website. My email is tmontague at cesnrg.com. And I'm also on Twitter, TG Montague on Twitter. With that, I want to thank Paulo Suarez for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Paulo. Thank you again for this was an awesome opportunity again. And yeah, thanks so much. Let's grow solar and storage. I'm Tim Montague. Take care.